Good morning. <laughs> All right, my name is Ngozi Chidoze, and um, our panel discussion for today is really around the role of the regulators as well as government towards driving the ev evolution of fintech companies. I think we can agree, we can all safely agree that there's a consensus around the benefits of the fintechs. We've, we've heard a, a presentation from um, the MD of Flutterwave, and we've also gotten feedback from all the numerous fintech organizations in Nigeria. So there's a consensus that there's a benefit um, that these, group, these groups of innovators are bringing. What there isn't a clear consensus around, though, is the role of governments and regulators. What role should the government be playing? So if you talk to a group of your respondents, they will tell you that they feel that the government and regulators are giving the fintechs a free hand to do and undo, and overburdening banks, insurance companies, and other financial service operators with um, regulation. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, if you talk to the fintechs, they tell you that they don't think governments and regulators are showing clarity, are showing leadership, are doing what they are supposed to be doing to make it a, a level playing field for them. Now, if you look across the globe, um, and I think Boye mentioned it earlier, Dorel also talked about it, if you look in the UK, the UK government has adopted a different approach to driving the fintech um, revolution and evolution. What have they done? They have decided to grant tax incentives and grants to businesses that focus on fintech. Add to that, very recently, there was a, a two billion pounds fund set aside for fintechs to play around with. If you take the Singaporean example, and I think that was what we talked about earlier, it's a different environment. The Monetary Authority in Singapore actually set up an institution focused on supporting fintechs. It's been funded, it's funded from various arms of government, and they want to convert Malaysia, so they want to convert Singapore into a fintech hub. Now, what is clear is that there's a role for the regulator, there's a role for government, but what should this role be? And what should be the role of banks, insurance companies, financial service organizations, fintechs, in driving this conversation? So that's the basis upon which we'd have our discussions today. So with me today to have this discussion are, very, are four very, very experienced men. Um, I'll start from my immediate left. The gentleman here is Adeshonubi. Adeshonubi is the MD of NIBS. Adeshonubi has upwards of 20 years experience in banking. Um, in his former life, he was, the, he was the executive director of IT and operations at Union Bank. In his current life, He's the managing director of NIBS, and he's done quite a lot of things in the payments uh, space. So, Adi is a friend of the family. Welcome, Adi. Okay. <laughs> by Adi is, um, sitting right by Adi is Akinwumi Olubkola. Akinwumi is a, a principal manager with the CBN. He works with the Department of Banking and Payment System. Now, Akim, Akimumi has played very important roles in defining how the drive to nationalize payment system in Nigeria, and particularly, he's played roles in the infrastructure team and the strategy team. Um, as we listened to the conversations prior to this, there were quite a number of questions that uh, people would want to ask the regulator. So, Akimumi, I'm putting you on. Uh, I'm putting you on, on guard. You will be receiving quite a number of questions from people. Sitting next to Akinyemi is Bumi Akinyemi Ju. He describes himself as a serial entrepreneur. 
And the reason why I agree with that description is that Bumi is the MD of a company that's called Venture Garden Group. He has investments in 15 fintechs across Africa. 15 fintechs across Africa. Now, someone made a crafty joke. Are these fintech companies profitable? <laughs> and, and the response to that is that, yeah, they're profitable. Bumi also has worked on developing quite a number of proprietary technologies across different sectors, so aviation, banking, government, just, just you name it, and, and he's done it. The last but certainly not the least is the gentleman that uh, anchored the presentation earlier. His name is Inyola Aboyeji. He's the, the founder of Flutterwave. But what he didn't mention is that he was also the co-founder of Andela. And I think we all know, we know Andela and, and the progress that Andela has made. So these are my distinguished panel members. Um, I would start the question uh, with you, uh, Akinumi, because you're the regulator. And the first question is this. What would you describe as the vision of the CBN as it relates to fintech? And where are we along this journey? Thank you very much. Um, basically, the CBN's vision on fintech is somehow encapsulated in the Payment System Vision 2020 and the Financial Inclusion Strategy of the bank. Um, we have laid it out that we want to enable access to finance. Now, Boye came out earlier on and talked about 66 million uh, unserved and about another 28 million, era on, uh, 28 million uh, Nigerians underserved. Those are the people that we want to see fintech uh, bring into the financial services space. Now, in doing that, if you look at what we've been doing in the last 10 years, is a role that uh, has been for us to open up the financial services space for fintechs to come in. After the financial uh, uh, payment system vision 2020 that was released in 2007, um, we identified areas where fintechs can play. And subsequent to that, in 2009, we had a mobile payments regulatory framework, which actually invited non-banks to come in and play. Subsequent to that, we've had the 2010-2011 period where we uh, introduced the cashless policy and also invited some other sets of fintechs to play, calling them payment terminal services providers. After that, we've had um, the payment system solution service providers, which we've allowed to also come in and play, most of them today non-banks. And I think that's where Flutterwave also uh, is playing at the moment. So you find out that our vision has always been to ensure that Nigerians, especially the unserved at the moment, are enabled by innovative service providers within the financial space, not necessarily the banks. Of course, we know the importance of ensuring collaboration between these new players and the traditional players. Basically, that's our perspective. Thank you very much. E, um, the next question is for you, actually. So we, we know that one of the biggest challenges for fintechs um, is being to drive scale, drive scale through raising capital. Certainly for you, I don't think that's such a big issue because in your presentation, you showed us uh, the number of backers that you have. And, and as I did my quick research, I also see the number of backers you have for Andela. So certainly not, it perhaps isn't a big issue for you, but I know that it's a big issue for a lot of the up and coming fintech companies. So, so fintechs have to now relate with banks and banks, um, as is usual, would ask for proper due diligence, which fintechs find a bit of a challenge. What do you think, from a fintech's perspective, that the regulator can do to moderate these excesses or these challenges? Absolutely. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. 
Um, the question of capital in the, in the fintech space is actually one that um, is, is, um, is, is critical because what you're seeing, and when we talk to a lot of investors, they're seeing the same thing, is there's a lot of interest in investing in this space. Um, and the interest is merely driven by the numbers. Um, anybody who sees the presentation that was made earlier in the day showing the number of unserved and underserved clearly understands that there is a huge opportunity to build um, either with the current players or completely alone, um, completely new infrastructure that can meet the demand. So what they see there is a lot of opportunity while we're seeing a lot of problems. But the concerns that remain are mainly around three things as far as we've seen. The, the first thing is, you know, um, how does the regulator um, see these fintech companies? And what are the requirements for getting in? Most investors don't want to invest in a pitch deck, um, even if, except you've done it before. And even if you've done it before, there's still a high bar. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is lowering the cost of entry and barriers to entry by um, partnering with um, you know, standard infrastructure providers. One of the biggest, uh, in our journey, one of the biggest things that we quickly realized was secure infrastructure costs a lot of money, right? You're, you're not just spending on servers, you're spending on security spans, you're spending on redundancy, and all these things can tend to eat up a startup's capital. And the, the fact of the matter is, um, like for example, for us at Flutterwave, our, our, our transaction capabilities are able to do um, something as much as 20 million transactions a second. Not many people need that kind of scale, but that's what's required by regulation. And at the end of the day, that's a lot of capacity that's going to waste. So what you can actually find is that one efficient infrastructure provider can serve multiple players. And encouraging shared services, not just in banking, but with fintechs, is actually one area where you can drive down costs and increase investment, make it faster for um, fintechs to reach those underserved and unserved people because the cost comes down considerably as well as their pricing as well, which is obviously of concern to the bank. And then I think that the third thing um, that they can do, so I mean, very few, very, a lot of people when they see fintechs, they talk a lot about the opportunities. Um, we've, we've been through that phase of talking a lot about the opportunities, but then now we're starting to get into a phase where we see real risks. And you know, someone was just having a conversation with me about how you know, Flutter's compliance process has gotten so much more strict, and it's because we've seen real, we've been burned, you know, and, and we want to protect our partners. And the key issues there, I think we have to resolve to be able to be a center of excellence for Africa. And they revolve around two things. The one is identity, right? And the BVN watch list is an amazing example of how the regulator has actually stepped in and supported fintechs um, so that they're able to identify bad actors and ban them from the financial system. But the second thing I think is going to be critically important is insurance. Payment insurance has to be in the, on the table and in the market because the truth of the matter is there's a tension, you can call it a healthy tension, between compliance and security and user experience and innovation, <laughs> right? And as a result, mistakes will be made. I mean, not that anybody's intending to make mistakes, but mistakes will be made. And then what happens in that scenario is that consumers' trust is weakened in the entire electronic financial system, which affects everybody. Um, and if you go to the US, there's insurance in place to basically protect the system against those shocks, right? Provided that the um, players are abiding by a very decent set of criteria. And I think there needs to be an industry conversation and framework around how do we restore trust in the electronic transaction system when mistakes are made? Because we're all humans in this room and we haven't done this for a very long time. Even if you go talk to, I mean, I was talking to a CEO of one of the big banks, I think it was Wells Fargo, and he was telling me how a few years back, right after the financial crisis, they had hundreds of millions of dollars missing <laughs> because, you know, they, they had some people hack it. And, but because they had insurance, they were able to weather that storm. So, I'm not saying that that's the intention, but I'm saying that if there's insurance available, and I think players are willing to pay for that insurance, I, we certainly are. Um, there's definitely going to be a lot more trust. We can serve customers faster and better and really push the game and increase people's trust in electronic transactions. Thank you very much. E, let, me, let, me, let me drive one of the points that you made um, a little further, and, and Akimumi, I actually want you to jump in on, on that question. So 
you had said that um, perhaps what regulators can do is to provide an avenue for fintechs to actually test out their ideas in a safe environment. And in many climes, that's, uh, that's very aching or similar to what you find as a sandbox, right? What's the CBN's perspective around um, establishing sandboxes, or if even, is that even an approach that we are looking at um, extending? Well, um, talking about regulatory sandbox, um, the elements of a sandbox are things that the Central Bank of Nigeria has been practicing even before it becomes a buzzword. However, um, perhaps not in a structured uh, uh, format or framework. But of recent, um, we've been discussing with some partners, uh, NIPS inclusive, uh, to see how we can structure it properly and ensure that um, we are able to come up with an approach that, is, that provides clarity and that is um, uh, predictable to those who may be coming in as innovators in the financial services space. So in terms of regulatory sandbox and enabling it in Nigeria, we are working towards that. Uh, what has to be in it? Uh, what, uh, do we, uh, what sort of regulation do we want to lower uh, its importance in the, within the sandbox? Um, what kind of qualification criteria would we have in order for uh, innovators to come into the sandbox and you know, leverage on the sandbox are issues that we need to discuss. And of course, what kind of um, technology standards would you want to enforce at that level when somebody is uh, still imagining or trying to come up with an idea? So I'll give you an example of what we do presently. We've had occasions where you see uh, an undergraduate of a technology uh, institution, say Yabatec, write into the CBN and say, I have an idea and I want to discuss it with you. And we invite them and we listen to them. I mean, that's what you have in a sandbox anyway. And they tell you, okay, this is my idea. This is what I can demo it for you. This is what I think I can do with it. And we tell them, okay, fine, this is nice. But perhaps you can think about it from this perspective and come back or collaborate with an established organization to push your idea forward. So you want to support an innovator, that's what we do presently. You want to give them clarity as to the regulation and how it applies to them, we do that presently. So, but for us to have that format, that structure, formal structure for a regulatory sandbox, we are working on that with NIPS at the moment. Thank you. All right, so because um, I'm happy you're working with NIPS because I actually wanted to throw the question to, to Adi. Um, if you had advice, but I'm not, that's not the question I'm asking you though. If you have an advice for them, what would it be? But let me, let me focus on my question to you. So NIPS occupies a pivotal role in the, in the payment space. And the payment space is arguably the space with the most fintech activity. Some people would argue that sharing information that you have with the ecosystem would be useful. What are your thoughts around that? I, I agree with you that sharing information with everybody is actually um, something that would improve the ecosystem. But I think the starting question is who owns the information? <laughs> And while we all take it for granted that the problem is with the banks, if I use the case of a PayPal that aggregates all your transactions online but passes only one transaction to the bank account, how many people go to PayPal and say, provide the information of this individual? You are empowered to share that data on this individual and therefore you should give access to another fintech. It's not the conversation that's going on. So unfortunately, the conversation is being dictated by fintechs who don't have market share and are hoping that lazy bankers whose customers are looking for more because they're not using the platforms would come to them. So everybody has a problem, including ourselves. So don't worry, I'm not blaming um, you alone. So really what we should be asking ourselves is how do we get this information together and then how do we share it so that either globally 
as a bank, I see my customers, and what they're doing with me or doing elsewhere, I can get information. You still have to take the decision. So having information from somebody else doesn't change or reduce your ability to make those calls. But I feel, and it's a personal view, that everybody should have access to information, but everybody should contribute. So the conversation is about there's data somewhere. Can we use it? And I'm saying it should be, can we pull data together and jointly use it? So we have a philosophy in NIBS. If you want to access the data we have, and you are an institution that's non-profit, share the results of your finding with the public. If you're a profitable institution, you have to contribute to the data before you have access to the data. You can't walk in and say, well, you have it. It will help my business. Even if you don't have the data now, you need to be part of the pool contributing to the data for the greater good. And that's the only way we will make progress. Not some people have the data, and therefore we are all game to have it, but I have my data and I keep it. And that's where I think we should go. Okay. Thank you very much. Bumi, any comments on that? Well, um, I, I, I think absolutely, from a, speaking from an investment perspective now, um, the idea of data is very important, right? Because as an investor, you know, somebody comes to make a pitch to you, the first question you're asking yourself is, how big is this market? How big can this thing get? And the only way you can show that to me is if you are, you know, quoting sources that are verifiable, that proves that, you know, the, let's say you're going for ATM transactions, you're trying to disrupt that. Okay, so show me the number of ATM transactions and how much the customer is paying, how you're going to lower the average cost for everybody and how you're going to make that market 10 times what it is today and how you're gonna take it global. So, so think about that value proposition. Now, if you can show the data from verifiable sources, it increases the likelihood uh, of checking that box that says that, oh, this is a good opportunity, the revenue is there, the market is there, and, and, and then you go. And I think that's very important from an investment perspective. Um, you know, if, if your specific question is around, sure. you know, data. Sure, and I'll extend that a little. Um, you know, I, dis I described you as a serial investor. <laughs> um, and it, it is clear, I think without a doubt, it's clear that there's a, a role for governments and regulators in, in driving the evolution of fintechs. Um, what is it that you would want regulators or governments to pay attention to, um, to encourage investor uh, confidence, er especially around this fintech infrastructure or this fintech e ecosystem? Sure. I think that's an easy question because we talk to investors all the time, you know, who, who make um, um, investments in this market or who are interested in making investments but they haven't actually made the leap. And I think um, what regulators and government can do, I'll break it down into three areas. I think the first one is government and regulators and CBN has to sort of decide, you know, what they stand for, right? So you can stand for just, hey, I'm just here to save the country from, you know, and customers and those type of things, and that is just the only thing I care about. Or they can say, hey, um, I want to stand for the growth of the industry, and while protecting customers. Or they can say, wow, we want to create, you know, an Africa financial services hub right here from Nigeria while protecting customers and ensuring there's no systemic risk to the financial services industry, right? So those three things take different shapes in terms of what is your leading strategy. And I think Nigeria has a unique opportunity because we have strong banks, we have so many banks, the penetration of Nigerian banks across Africa is incredible compared to any other country, even South Africa. So, so define who you want to be and then your guidelines, your regulations, and you know, whether you over-regulate or you're in the mi middle um, kind of feeds up from there. And how you even staff the bank in terms of the central bank is also derived for that piece. And I think it's a huge market opportunity that if we don't capture very soon, guys like Kenya and so on and so forth will take it over 
and their own fintechs and their own banks will be the one that will control the financial services industry of the region. I think number two is building that ecosystem. The gentleman that was talking about Israel talked about the regulators saying, okay, banks, come, sit down here. Fintechs, come, sit down here. You know, and literally force the conversation and say, hey, you have to open up, you have to experiment, you have to try, you know, we're ready to allow you to go. We will watch closely. But if it's more of this, this situation of fear, ah, CBN has called me, oh, what do they want? You know, <laughs> it's a different dimension entirely. So when you look at the types of regulators that we could be aspiring to be like, whether it's the Singapore one, whether it's FCA in the UK, I think we can take a cue for, from them, uh, or Israel, and I think ecosystem building could be part of the role that CBN plays as opposed to this fearful organization, you know, they're more like the one driving collaboration across everybody, you know, saying, hey, work together. A bank is saying they don't want to open up for free. They say, come here, open. You know, so I think that could be a whole new world if we embrace that kind of, you know, idea. And then the last thing, I think, is this concept of really thinking global. I think too many banks, too many fintechs, you know, regulators, we always just think that the market is just Nigeria, and we're quoting the population of Nigeria, underbanked in Nigeria, and all of those types of things. And I think it's very short-sighted, because the market opportunity you're playing with is lower. The valuation of your business as a fintech is lower, when all you're telling me is Nigeria opportunities. But tell me about cross-border opportunities, because it doesn't, if you're not thinking about it, guess what, you know, WeChat in China, they're going to come. Right? PayPal is going to come. Western Union, MoneyGram, they're coming. So everybody will come here if we just refuse or if we just think that the world is in this country. And I think it also drives bad behavior because I'm closed. I don't want to share my data with you because we feel like we're just we're competing on these 30 million banked customers. But if your domain is you know, Kenya, Ethiopia, South Africa, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Francophone West Africa, and those are the numbers you're playing with. And by default, your technology is multilingual, multi-currency from day one. Then you're not going to be worried about competition between Flutterwave and Paystack. It won't matter because you're looking at a bigger market. And I think government regulation, regulators can play a role to foster that type of thinking. And it will be exciting for investors. Sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. E, the, the, the question I have is for you, right? Um, do you think fintechs are focusing sufficiently on supporting government's financial inclusion leanings? Should fintechs be supporting that? So do you think they are sufficiently supporting it? Should they be supporting it? Or should they be focused largely on the banked population um, that already have access to financial services? Um, now, so, so that's, that's part A. <laughs> Regulator, you'll have to come in and give your own perspective after he gives um, his answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the first thing is, um, I, I absolutely, I mean, from the point of view of Flutterwave, we, we really believe that it's actually profitable for us to focus on, we don't like the word financial inclusion, we like to call it financial deepening. So we like financial deepening, okay. right? So the idea is that we don't believe there should be a banking system for poor people and a banking system for rich people. Um, we believe that it's one banking system. The question is, how can we help banks make, their, make it scalable and profitable to serve customers that might not necessarily meet a certain threshold today, right? That's what our belief is. So actually key to our strategy is serving those customers. And we've worked very closely with NIBS on MCash. We've worked very closely with a lot of, uh, we actually are on the Financial Services Innovation, Innovation Committee where we're supporting Central Bank and NIBS to open up the space to even more fintechs so that we can collectively serve the, the customer. If, the, if we're really serious about financial deepening, we have to leverage regulation to reduce the cost of serving on the, on the banks and underserved customers, right? And I think if you do that, more fintechs will find it profitable 
to serve those customers, and they can do it more scalably, and you'll see the impact that you're looking for. So can you mean? Okay. Um, I think it's also important for FinTech uh, to actually dimension properly what is out there. Um, we talk about the urban band, and then the so-called poor that we want to include somewhere in the remote areas. And you know, there's a nexus between the two anyway. If we look at the issue of um, data, like um, the MD of Nibs mentioned, and we're looking at it from the two sides, those who are banked have a relationship with the unbanked. Now, if you leverage that relationship, you may likely get skill at a faster rate and achieve much more than you'll achieve with the few that are clustered in our various urban areas. That is one part we are not looking at and which we should start focusing on as fintechs. Um, if you look also from the perspective of what are we bringing on board, we always seem to look at payment services, but we are talking of financial technology, which is, I mean, to, to serve the, the, the un, unserved, which includes the, uh, the, the underserved that are not accessing pensions, for example, insurance, credit. Those are other opportunities that we are not layering on what we have at the moment. So we have this cluster around payment services, and we are limiting the extent to which we can serve and actually bring down the cost, of, cost to serve. So we need to be looking at that aspect. Now, talking about uh, the cost of regulation or the cost of compliance, I should say. We have, uh, as, as the Central Bank of Nigeria, we believe that collaboration among regulators will also help that. Because I think it's time that um, uh, regulators started speaking to each other to see how we can all have um, some sort of single one-stop shop policy uh, framework that can enable any fintech to see end-to-end -end the regulation it may have to contend with and also you know, appreciate how to go about managing the cost of compliance. Then lastly, technology should actually bring down the cost of compliance in a way. Because when you look at it, um, if you understand what I will be looking for as a regulator, Funny enough, I work on the compliance part. If you understand what I need to do, what you need to give me as a regulator, and you can dimension your technology to provide that without necessarily incurring further cost of having to interface with me all the time. So you start talking about reg tech. But you can, I always believe that reg tech as well can be embedded in the fintech space without needing to build a new platform for that. So there are opportunities for everyone to actually see the bigger picture and collaborate to bring down the uh, cost of compliance, as well as get the larger pie that is ahead of us. Thank you. Thanks. Ade? Okay. Uh, very quickly, and rather than advising the banks, which you did, I'm going to try and advise um, the fintechs. Number one know what your business is and stop going to the central bank. Every day we have people coming, saying they are fintechs, and all they want to do is aggregate data. So my question is, why are you looking for a license from the central bank? We think everything fintech is payments. It is not. So if you are clear what you are trying to do, if it's not payments, if it's not lending, what are you doing with the central bank? If it's insurance, why are you talking to the central bank? Obviously, it's a different regulator we should speak to. So we as fintech sometimes overburden ourselves with the fear of regulation because we don't understand what we are trying to sell and therefore who we should be talking with. That's the first bit. The second bit is that, ironically, the four of us here, <laughs> including the central bank, are involved um, in some program that should make it easier for fintechs to try or experiment. A sandbox that will be put in place, it won't be perfect, but it will be improved upon and fintechs should have access to it. Around what they are working on is how can they make it easier, even in the regulatory space, 
for fintechs who have limited risk, limited capacity, to at least try out their ideas. Hopefully, before the end of the year, something will come out on it. So there are ongoing collaborations now. And that's what the fintechs have to do. It's a scale game. Most fintechs cannot scale. So when my brother here was talking about financial inclusion, please don't waste your time. It's true, if you are not bellyful as they say, what are you going out there to try and do things that are fancy? If the government is not funding you, don't do it. Because you will not have sufficient capital to scale. We have 30 million, 30.6 million bank customers, individuals based on BVN. Only 3.5 million of them use cards in shops a month. So potentially, there are another 27 million of them that you should be focusing on. Sure. They have bank accounts, they have cards, they understand what uh, regulatory education and what financial education is. Why are you going to meet somebody in a village who's never seen a card before? If they don't make it worth your while, don't go. <laughs> no, it's true. In terms of payments, only 12 million out of those 30 do transfers. And then, so who are we helping? You're a private company. People have invested in you. They expect some kind of return. So unless they're an NGO, the World Bank, or what have you, you should be making sure that there's some return for them. So please, let's get focused. It's a business at the end of the day. It's not a hobby. Too many of you come with this idea that you are techies, you have the best solution in the world. I agree. But if people are not using it, it's crap. I'm hoping... And those are some of the things I hope um, sessions like this will bring out is that we actually need to work together because it's difficult for us individually to scale. It's difficult for us individually to have all the ideas. And it's when we work together we can share. Another advice, don't move near payments. Between Flutter Wave, between Inye and his people, uh, between Flutter Wave, Paystack and two or three others, the original fintechs in Nigeria were payment companies. They've come at the, come at the market. InterSwitch, uh, System Spec, and Co. Again, it's a scale game. They are running millions of transactions. You want to start with 10,000. How can you be profitable? <laughs> so it's about where is the value for the customer. And really, payment is becoming nothing more than a utility. That's not the value. It's what you layer it on. So the easy pickings that were payments, those fruits have largely been taken by those people. But there are other opportunities there. Let's start looking at them. And many of those opportunities do not require the central bank. So open up our minds, let's collaborate, throw information into the pot we're willing to share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adi. <laughs> um, and, and we've, we've actually run out of time. We've actually run out of time. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll exclude Ade and give the other three panelists the opportunity to give their final thoughts or final comments on, on the topic that we, we just discussed. So uh, perhaps, Akimumi, you want to start? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I mean, I think in terms of final thoughts, for me, um, I agree with a lot of what uh, Mr. Shonubi said in terms of, you know, how fintech should be thinking about value creation, right? And value-added services is probably where some of the largest opportunities um, exist within the fintech world. But overall, in terms of the topic of today of... Um, you know, basically what can government do? Um, I, I think it's just important to re-emphasize that Ni Nigeria is not going to sort of transcend this issue around oil revenue, diversification, and so on and so forth, if we don't take certain sectors seriously. And I think the tech sector presents a huge opportunity, but more importantly, the fintech subsector creates an exponential opportunity but we cannot capitalize on that opportunity unless we realize that this game is really about the control of capital and talent, right? And coincidentally, Nigeria is actually sitting in a very good space. So how can a fintechs have access to capital? 
access to capital. That's what everybody is talking about today. And I think um, the huge opportunities for banks, for example, um, part of what was presented today is to buy. So banks can actually start entertaining acquisition opportunities of fintechs, right? We're not touching that at all. And that represents a huge opportunity. Now, the reason I also mentioned that is that there's a catalytic effect that that creates. Because the moment you start having some exits, what happens? You start attracting more capital. And the moment we start controlling capital going into innovation, then Nigeria becomes a major, major hub. And I think it's more of a call to action for banks to play a role, for regulators to support. And instead of a very, very hardened stance about regulation, Mr. Shonubi was saying fintechs run to CBN. It's because they're scared of CBN. <laughs> you know? So they would rather just go and just go and, okay, this is what I'm doing, though. And <laughs> so I, I, think, I think there's an opportunity for CBN to come out and just say, hey, guys, go. Go and do it. But just let me watch you as you're doing it. Stay close to me so I see what you're doing. Because, of course, we don't want to create bad user experiences. We don't want customers to lose their money. That's not really the point. But it's better for fintechs not to be afraid of the regulator so they can do it in front of the regulator and be sharing their learnings and sharing that data as you go. I call that sort of adaptive regulation. So can we adapt something like that? And I think um, essentially it's exponential uh, from there for the fintech uh, market in Nigeria. Thank you. I, I just have a, a really brief comment, and I, I think really where it comes from is, um, you know, for the truth is, for probably 15 years now, we've not really had an as open um, a fintech space as we've had over the last three years, and it, I'm re we're really, really lucky to be um, operating as a fintech company in this time. I, I, I sit down sometimes with the older folks um, who started companies before, and it feels like this is completely different from their experience in building and growing companies. And there's so much more collaboration, there's so much more sharing, and quite frankly, I mean, even as little as five years ago, there's no chance a fintech company and the regulator will be sitting on the same panel, right? We typically didn't come to these conferences <laughs> until last year. KPMG never invited us, right? So, <laughs> they didn't think they were, were that important. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting time, and we have to think about everything as beginning again. Um, so, I mean, de definitely, I think the payment opportunity has been a bit, uh, has been a bit flogged, but uh, quite frankly, there are probably pockets of value that are still there, um, and the barrier is regulation. One of the things that we are trying to do is really democratize the payment infrastructure. Everybody should be able to, you know, accept payments, issue their own cards. Every store should have store credit on their cards. Everybody should be able to build their own payment infrastructure as they want to, bank or non-bank. You shouldn't have to pay anybody to, be, to tweak your own payments infrastructure so that you can serve your customers in a new way because they've changed. Our whole goal is just how do we keep this place open, flexible to ideas, and then support all your needs from that point of view. And then that's what's going to make it easier for startups. And, and also, how do we inspire our competitors to do the same? That's, that's the truth. I think a lot of companies have become very, surprisingly very open over the last 24 months, right? There were companies that would never offer APIs to startups that are now offering APIs to startups. There are banks that would never talk to startups that are now hosting fintech hackathons. And this is what we're trying to drive. This is why we're in the market. And my goal is, uh, our goal as a company, as Flutterwave, we're going to continue to push openness in the, in the, while keeping consumers safe. And the goal is, if, if we have a truly open ecosystem, everybody will see the benefit. And then the companies that just simply want to build aggregator layers or data layers or platform companies on top of it will have an opportunity to do so. Because the truth is, what we're really facing is, um, is what we call is data colonialism if we, don't, if we don't open up and work together, right? Because WhatsApp, Facebook, Google will always be able to get that conversation with InterSwitch and the bank. They will always be able to get that conversation with, um, with whoever. It might not even be you, you know, you never know, but you have the same capabilities. So how do you protect yourself, hedge yourself against disruption from external forces while you work together and create your own walled garden? 
so that if they come into the ecosystem, then they have to compete with our intellect and our knowledge of the market, rather than they competing just simply on the basis of one person's regulatory arbitrage. So I think it's very important for us to really collaborate as an industry, think very carefully about it. And I think one thing is we need to build more um, trust in the consumer. We're learning every day that consumers don't trust electronic payment platforms. It's an epidemic. And we all need to do more with our customer service to be able to do, to do this. And what we're learning is it's a cascade, right? So the bank doesn't, doesn't give us the right response. And then because you know, the customer service doesn't give the customer the right response. We don't know what's going on. The bank doesn't know what's going on. And the customer loses trust in the system and doesn't believe it's worth pursuing digital payments, even though it's good for them. We have to come together as an industry and restore trust to the electronic payment system, either by insurance, by making sure customers feel like when they use this channel, it's better than cash. And I think once we do those two things, I think, I don't, I personally, when, when people say, how did China build such a powerhouse in the face of all these global platform players that seem so powerful? And I think really what it is is just, well, in their case, they had a very strong regulator who forced everybody to work together. But I think in our case, we can do this in a democratic fashion because we're a democratic country. And just ultimately um, um, leverage on the one single unique um, um, trait of the Nigerian, which is self-interest, right? In our own self-interest, we'll collaborate and make sure that we don't all get disrupted. Thank you. Thank you Okay, so it's always good to have the final word. Um, if we look at what we've been doing, there will always be room for improvement. The CBN has always been an enabler to fintechs. Right from as far back as 2009, where there was no non-bank player within the industry at all, till date. We made it possible for non-banks to come into this space. It, starting from 2007 when we issued the Payment System Vision 2020 and then the regulatory framework for mobile payments. I recall very well when Tayo Viosu of Baga called into CBN and I was lucky to be the one to pick the call and said, look, I'm somewhere in the United States, I'm planning to do this. I said, fine, yes, we've just released our mobile payments regulatory framework and today we talk about Baga. We have always enabled fintechs. We will continue to enable fintechs. However, we will not be an enabler, um, apologies to Ngozi and the ladies in the house, like um, Eve in the biblical Garden of Eden that enabled illumin illumin uh, illumination but got sent out completely. <laughs> so in our own self-interest, like you mentioned, and in the self-interest of fintechs, as well as the bankers, we won't allow a meltdown of the financial system by looking away at security, safety, and convenience and efficiency of the service to the customers. We'll continue to do that, but we'll do that especially through collaboration, which we have been preaching. We have always found ways of bringing everybody together. At the moment, at the moment we are encouraging financial service innovators through the forum uh, that uh, NIPS is uh, you know, uh, uh, encouraging at the moment. We will continue to do that. We will look at areas where we can improve our regulation, especially as we are going through the idea of setting up the regulatory sandbox and see how we can lower the cost to fintechs. However, in lowering that cost, it is important to note that Central Bank of Nigeria is not the only regulator in the financial services industry. It is important also to note that there are certain incentives that the fiscal side of government must bring on board. We've talked about uh, UK, for example, the R&D tax credit is there. We can be thinking of something similar here. Um, we've also seen opportunities uh, for having pioneer uh, status for uh, uh, fintechs. We should also be thinking about that. Today, I think yesterday, we were celebrating the fact that we are amongst the top 10 most improved countries in terms of uh, uh, ease of doing business. 
if we direct the same passion that we did in, towards that direction in the last six months, if we direct it to the initiative under the Economic and Recovery Growth Plan, which talked about enabling competitive environment through digital-led economy, perhaps we will start off something quickly fast on our Smart Digital Nigeria project, which, of course, as, uh, as expounded in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the growth plan, says that we are going to have uh, technology clusters, we are going to back cybersecurity policies and uh, encourage software development. If we do all that from the perspective of other agencies that need to put something on board, and we had the CBN's initiative to it, and get all other regulators to come together, together and come out with a platform that fintechs can easily access and understand the environment, we will achieve much tra traction than we have achieved so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. On, on, on that note, um, sadly, we've come to the end of this panel um, discussion. I want to use this opportunity to thank my panelists. Ade, thank you very much. Akinwumi, Bumi, E, thank you very much. <laughs>